Yeah, so good morning to everyone. Uh, in the previous class, we were discussing about uh, one of the ground improvement techniques. So that's on the stone column. So this is one of the deep replacement technique. Uh, we had a very long introduction uh, and a few design details about the stone column. But uh, let me again take a small tour of uh, some introductory details which we have missed during the presentation. So let me try to cover a uh, little more details about the stone column. So as uh, we were discussing, so there are uh, different variety of the stone columns that you may come across when you refer to any book. So if you have the stone columns uh, techniques are shown here. For example, there is a vibro replacement, vibro displacement, vibro concrete column, controlled stiffness, uh, controlled modular stiffness column, so on and so forth. So these techniques, everything fall under the category of the stone columns. However, the kind of the material that is used for construction of the stone column is different. More than that, depending upon the properties of the soil, for example, if you look at this slide, the vibro replacement technology is mostly used for cohesive soils with undrained shear strength of higher than 15 kilopascals. While if you go to vibro displacement technology, it says it is suitable for insensitive cohesive soils with undrained shear strength ranging from 15 to 15 to 60 kilopascals. Uh, and apart from that, there is also another constraint in the form of a depth. So if you refer to any book, you can easily understand the fundamental difference between the vibro replacement and the vibro displacement. Replacement means we are completely removing the soil by making a borehole and filling the void with some other material. You are replacing one material with the another material. While in vibro displacement, we may not be removing the material rather. So we are allowing the material to displace in the lateral direction and whatever the void which has been created. So that is again filled with the stiff material. So in case of the vibro replacement uh, by vibro displacement, we can also construct the other things called as a vibro concrete column. So vibro concrete column it is typically called as a YCC. So there is another thing without any displacement or without any replacement, we can also insert another column that is called as a controlled modulus stiffness column. So everything has their own application and utility. So depending upon the soil properties, either you can use vibro displacement or vibro replacement or vibro concrete column or controlled modulus. There are other things also like sand compaction column. So and uh, in case of granular stone column and a rammed aggregate column and dynamic replacement. So encased granular column is typically used when there is a zero lateral support from the soil because the encasement has to support the aggregates which are uh, arranged in the form of a column. The rammed aggregate column, this is very similar to the ramp, but uh, this is one of the stone columns only, but here uh, this is a very primitive technology that is used to construct the stone column. It's a simple technique is ramming action. Uh, depth is another constraint. Then dynamic replacement, this we have already understood uh, in one of the previous ground improvement chapters. So uh, if you ask me uh, or if you recall, what is the definition of the stone column? So it is uh, well, a ground improvement technique where vertical columns of compacted aggregates are formed through the soil to be improved. So here the important thing that you need to understand is the aggregates are pumped through the bottom of the or some mechanism, but they, they need to be compacted to a proper degree. So without compaction, we can't call them as a column and they can't be able to bear the superstructure load also. So therefore, the compaction is one of the essential uh, measuring parameter to understand about the stone columns. So since we are compacting the aggregates, you can understand. Suppose if I compact an aggregate and if I compact a sand material. So as the stiffness of these two materials are immensely different. So therefore, there should be a 
major disparity in their load carrying capacity. So these columns results in considerable vertical load carrying capacity and improved shear resistance due to higher strength and stiffness. So as we are using the aggregates, either you talk about the sand or the aggregates, both are free draining material, thereby they accelerate or they initiate accelerated consolidation and thereby so accentuate the settlement to the clay soils. So the major advantage of the stone column is that the construction is very simple. So usually the stone columns are comparable with the pile foundation. Because in fact, uh, if anybody, any engineer has a recommended a pile foundation, so then if somebody comes with a uh, question that is there any replacement to the pile foundation, so you can immediately think about the stone columns and the amount of the time required to construct the stone column is much, much lesser than the time required to construct a uh, pile foundation. But of course, the cost is the another factor. The cost of the deep foundation, the pile foundation is astronomically higher than the cost of the stone column construction. And wherever we could not able to construct the pile foundation, there the stone column can be constructed. So that is another advantage. There are three different uh, stone columns. This also we have discussed flexible columns, rigid columns and semi-rigid semi columns. Flexible means simple stone column, rigid column means a concrete column, semi-rigid means encased stone column. So these are a few exemplary situations where the stone column technique is prevalently used. So if you look at all these situations, there is, there is a one common thing. That common thing is that the load comes onto the foundation is significantly high. If you take a, a tank foundation, there is an immense concentrated load only at the small area. Similarly, ports where uh, large cranes are installed. Uh, footings are especially wrapped foundations, reinforced earth walls, railways, highway embankments. So in all these situations, there are two important things. One is the concentrated load, huge amount of the concentrated load is coming over a short area or short width. The second aspect is the foundation should be ready to bear the vertical loads within a short period of time. So these are the two important aspects that normally impel you to go for uh, the stone column technology. So other things about suitability of the stone columns, any soil type that does not respond to vibration alone is ideal candidate for the stone column construction. So these soils include silty and clayey sands, silts, clays and some layered soils as we told. So all these kinds of the soil, they won't respond to the vibration, rather they act as some kind of the dampening media, thereby they absorb the energy. And stone columns are also not suitable for sensitive clays and silts. Uh, cohesive, mixed and layered soils are generally do not densify easily when subjected to vibration alone. So under those circumstances, so the stone column technology is ideally suitable. So suited, suited for widespread loads. Now another important aspect so that we should talk about is Whenever you think of ground improvement of a large area, large area, there you should you can immediately think about the implementation of the stone column ground improvement technique. Soils having low to medium safe bearing capacity, uh, as I told, the stone columns right after their construction, they could able to bear the loads. So that's why wherever there is a problem of bearing capacity, you can think of uh, the stone column as an alternative ground improvement. So effectively used for large area stabilization. Uh, yeah, this is one of the important uh, guideline to select two different techniques. Those are called vibro replacement and vibro compaction. Vibro replacement means the stone column. Vibro compaction means maybe uh, there is another vibro flotation technique. So that is called as a vibro compaction or there is simple displacement of the soil without its removal. So when fines contained more than 12% and are clay contained of more than 2%, so cannot be compacted by the vibro compaction. 
uh, here there are different zones which has been earmarked on this graph. Uh, this is simple particle size distribution graph only. So this is a C, D, uh, B, C, D. Uh, C and D zones are specifically suitable for uh, the stone column technology. So here zone C, silty sand with 12% to 20% fines is treated with the stone column. So zone C is ideally suitable. In fact, the zone D also. When zone other zones are suitable for vibro compaction, where we don't need to remove the soil. Simply you compact it, so then uh, they will be able to take the loads. And here uh, some other guidelines uh -huh. that, that talk about the suitability of the method. Sorry, suitability of the method. Sands with less than 5% fines, the stone column is excellently works. Sands with less than 12% fines, it's also excellent. Silt, it is good. Clay, it is good. But sensitive soils, it might not work. So there are Sir? another. Yeah. So this guideline was for a stone column. Yeah, for stone column. Okay, sir. So there are uh, some other information. The stone columns are particularly useful when the undrained shear strength of the soil is very low. That is in the range of 10 to 50 kilopascals. Uh, probably you, you might not be able to understand right now what is the meaning of 10 to 50 kilo kilopascals. But if you really calculate the bearing capacity of the soil, taking into account such low undrained shear, shear strength of the soil, you hardly get anything. You hardly get anything. Okay, so when there is no bearing capacity or the soils are unable to bear any load, so in those situations, so we have to go for or we can use the stone garden. Otherwise, subsoils weaker than that may not provide sufficient lateral support for the columns. So in those situations also, you can recommend the stone column. For large site improvement, stone columns are most effective to a depth of 6 to 10 meters. Stone columns saturated cohesive soils work as drainage system and decrease consolidation time. So, in fact, uh, this technique also, if you are dealing with clay soils, then you will reap dual benefit. One benefit is accelerated consolidation. The second benefit is immediate load bearing capacity. While in case of uh, the fine sands, where fine or loose sands, where the bearing capacity could be a problem, but there will not be any kind of a consolidation. So in those situations also, the stone columns are ideal. So after stone columns are constructed, a fill material should always be placed over the ground surface and compacted before the foundation is constructed. So this is in a sense, once the stone column is constructed, so each stone column will act as an individual element individual element. So therefore, if you directly put the load without any kind of a blanket layer on top of the improved ground, what happens is the majority of the load might go onto an individual column element, which is not advisable in real life. So therefore, in order to ensure that the load is distributed on, to the, on all columns, what need to be done is you put some kind of the uh, fill it uh, blanket layer so by filling with some suitable material suitable material. so any construction on top of this fill material so it leads to some uniform distribution of the load on all the columns on all the columns it is a, a simple thing like when you have a pile group what you do in order to ensure that the load is going uniformly over all the piles, you construct or you integrate them with the pile cap. And the foundation is directly laid on top of the pile cap. So the pile cap, so it receives the load from the superstructure and distributes uniformly. So within or among all the piles. So here the fill also does the same function. Now these are the uh, fundamental mechanisms by which the stone columns works. One is intensification, reinforcement, load bearing, stress distribution and drainage. So in fact, uh, from all the previous discussion, we could able to understand 
how they are acting as a drainage media or how they are distributing the load, how they are bearing the load, how they are acting as a densification or a reinforcement. But there are some other guidelines. Closely spaced drainage boundaries inhibits development of excess pore water pressure. So that means your spacing will be an important parameter. So in the design consideration, so when you deal with the stone column. So the basic principle of densification is rearrangement of the particles into a denser state. So this especially happens when there is an accelerated consolidation is taking place within the clay material. Within the clay material. So as a result, modulus, strength and resistant liquefaction of the geomaterials are increased. So when we talk about liquefaction, now, you should understand that such terminology is valid only in case of the sand material. Okay, so not for the clay material. While the permeability and collapsibility are reduced. So once you are densifying the in situ soil, say whether it is a clay or uh, sand material, doesn't matter. So once you are densifying it, so it is obvious that the permeability of the such strata at the media decreases. So since you are already allowing the soil to settle. It is obvious that the collapse potential of such soil also reduces. So collapsibility is very pertinent in case of the cohesive, non cohesive soils. So these are a few benefits uh, when you opt for the stone column technique. Stone columns are technically and potential economical alternative to the foundation. So as I told, wherever you come across the suggestion of the pile foundation, you can immediately think of stone column as an alternative to such deep foundation system. Stone columns are more economical than the removal and replacement of deep poor bearing soil and large site. So very useful where infrastructure does not permit high vibration technique such as a dynamic compaction deep blasting or piling. So this is also one of the important factor so that I have discussed in the very first classes of the ground. Uh, for example, if the ground improvement has to be done in the locality where there are a lot of residences are there. So there is uh, some problem. This also we understood in the form of one parameter that is called the peak particle velocity. You just recall in the last class. So the peak particle velocity exceeds certain value. It create some kind of a disturbance to the nearby locality or often if the velocity is too high, it may even lead to collapse of the adjacent structure. So therefore, wherever vibration is not allowed in those situations or in those places. So you can think of uh, the or, uh, in fact, it's not exactly vibration I should say because uh, in case of the stone column technology also there is some amount of the vibration is there but not like a dynamic compaction or blasting or piling. So when compared with these techniques, the intensity of the vibration in case of the stone column technique is much, much lesser. So wherever you require a speedy construction, so then you can think of the stone column. Stone columns provide a vertical drainage path for access for water pressure dissipation because they are three draining materials. With vibro rotation, differential settlements are often impermissible limits because the majority of the loads are carried only by the stone columns. Only the minority of the load is uh, dispersed onto the soil. So these are the few real life examples where the stone column technology has been implemented and found working very well. Uh, I don't uh, so let skip all these slides because of the time constraint. Rather, we discuss about some design aspects. So this is uh, the construction technology. So this is called as a vibro float. So you can see this is a very big device and it is attached to the crane. And this is how the stone column is constructed. So uh, this is the crane first. So this is a vibro float. The vibro float inserted into the ground. While the advancement of this vibro float happens by two things, either you can use a jet of water to advance the bore hole or jet of air. So both can be used depending upon the soil type. If it is a clay soil type, so then you can you have to use the jet of water uh, because usually clay soils are saturated. While if it is uh, the cohesionless loose sand, then you can think of going for the dry. 
that is uh, air as a media to advance the boat hole. So the vibro float as a specific provision to feed the material through its bottom as you can see in this slide. So here you can see how the material is fed from top of the vibro float to the bottom. So uh, this is something like a hollow portion. So within the vibro float. Uh, uh, sometimes if the borehole is able to stand with itself or maybe by some other mechanism, we can directly pour the material from the top also. So both the options are possible. OK, uh, and here. So this is how the stone column is constructed. Uh, vibro replacement uh, in fact same. Uh, so this is uh, uh, installation of the stone column a few schematics. So this is a wet top field method of installation. So top field and bottom field. So there are two ways. So this is dry bottom field. And this is stone column construction. Here you can see the length of the vibro. vibro uh, no, this is not a vibro. So this is a trimming. So which is used to feed the aggregates. So here, uh, the, using this trimming, the aggregates are fed through this uh, host pipe to the vibro float and to the ground. So here you can see how the aggregates are feeded from top. That is top feed. Stone column construction by top. In fact, feeding at the top, but released at the bottom. And this is uh, some real time monitoring to ensure that the aggregates were compacted properly to the desired degree. Which otherwise, so there is no, if you don't monitor the compaction capability or the degree of compaction, then we might not be accomplishing the desired requirement, in to, say, in terms of. The stability are in terms of the bathing capacity. So this I will skip all these things uh, and this part we have already discussed with low transfer mechanism and we have also derived uh, a few equations. So therefore I will skip it all these things. So these things are not required. Yeah, so in fact, uh, we were also discussing about the failure modes. So when you talk about the failure mechanism, so it strongly depends upon the length of the stone column. So there are some guidelines so which people have proposed based on extensive experimental investigations, say in the real life or based on the lab scale data. So if the length of the column is greater than four times of the dia, failure is due to bulge. While if the length of the column is less than four times of the dia, the failure is general shape failure. So columns experience less bulging when loaded over an area greater than its own. Uh, suppose, say, if the diameter of the stone column is 1.5 meter, if the confined, if the load application is remain confined to only 1.5 meter, there is a one kind of failure or if the load is spread even outside of the stone column also, then there is another kind of a failure. So here you can see, so the load spread even behind the diameter of the stone column, the load is just confined to the diameter of the stone column. So, so here, since this is a long column, the failure is predominantly by the bulging. While here, uh, this slide, both short column and long column, both are shown. So uh, in fact, this we have de discussed in detail so in the previous class. So long column bulging, maximum bulging could occur at a depth of 2D and the bulging can extend as deep as four times of the diameter of the stone column. Short columns, if the bottom bottom strata is hard, bearing capacity the failure. So if, the, uh, if it is a floating, then it is a end bearing, punching failure. Then if, if there exists a very soft soil in between, then there may be possible, if it is uh, uh, right near the ground surface, it is a bearing capacity failure. If it at some intermediate depth, then that is called as a local bulge. Yeah. So now let us come to the another important aspect. Uh, so that I will specifically want to discuss is the design considerations of the stone column. Here 
uh, we have seen the basic definition of the stone column. What the basic definition is? The aggregates are compacted within the borehole, which is made using any suitable technique. Now, when I say the aggregates and their compaction, can we use any type of the aggregates? The first question comes to the mind or do we need to have some kind of the guidelines or some selection criteria on the aggregates, which is called as a backfill material. So Brown in the year 1977 has proposed some kind of the rating system to select the most appropriate material as a backfill material. So the, here the equation is SN is equal to 1.7 into square root of 3 by D50 square. So he has uh, specifically used D10, D20 and D50 and depending upon the value of the SN, so he has proposed some kind of the rating system. So this is called a suitability number. If the suitability number is 0 to 10, such material is excellently useful as a backfill material. If suitability number is between 10 to 20, so it is good. 20 to 30, fairly useful. 30 to 40, better to discard. It is poor. Greater than 50, unsuitable. You have to completely discard. Okay, so this rating system can be used so to select the backfill material. Then the another important aspect when it comes to the design is what kind of the pattern do we need to follow? So since beginning of the ground improvement, we were talking about only two patterns, triangular pattern and square pattern. So the relationship between effective area or the effective zone and the spacing is 0.866 S square in case of the triangular and 1 S square in case of the square. So these schematics will show you uh, the basic distinction between the rectangular pattern and the triangular pattern. There is another pattern that is possible is a radial pattern for stone columns. But either rectangular or triangular are predominantly used patterns in general. Then uh, some specific guidelines about the diameter of the column. So depending upon uh, the equipment that is used for the installation, so you can think of uh, the following diameters. For example, sand compaction columns, uh, if you use the casing, 0.6 to 0.8 meter. Stone columns, vibro probe, 0.5 to 1.2 meter. So rammed aggregate column, auger and rammer is used, 0.7 to 0.9. Vibro concrete column, 0.5 to 0.6. So here, if you look at these uh, values, one particular thing that you can notice, wherever there is a stone column, the diameter range is wider. So if you look at 0.5 to 1.2 and 0.6 to 0.8, sand compaction column or the Vibro concrete column, that is 0.5 to 0.6. So when you use Vibro concrete column, the possibility of the lateral expansion of that material is very less. While if you look at the stone column, so though you may be starting with the initial diameter of the 0.5 meter, but when you compact the aggregates, so they will move in the lateral direction. So therefore, whatever the initial diameter that you are presuming might not be the same at the end of the construction. So it may go up to 0.8 or even up to 1. So then uh, there are other specific guidelines. No. No. Yeah. In the previous slide, Please, yeah, the pattern spacing is given here 0 0.866 a square. Is this is the term of smear effect only? Uh, no, there is no smear effect in this case, na? because uh, we are not making any kind of a borehole. Then uh, what is this S? Sir? S is spacing between columns. Either S1 or S2. Here. S means either S1 or S2. Sir. Yeah. But in the previous class, we think na, uh, D equal to 1.05 years for square pattern, like that. Ah, but what is, is here? That is, uh, if you talk about the radius or diameter, both are same. But in that case and in this case, S is the spacing only. Okay. So, sir, uh, so, sir, after calculating 0.866 S square, what will get? Uh, zone of influence diameter. Uh, 
like your AC, AS, AE. Okay, sir. Okay. Now, uh, there are other guidelines also. So here, if you look at this graph, there is a relationship between shear strength versus capital D by small d. So capital D is the diameter of the casing and small d is the diameter, sorry, capital D is the diameter of the stone column and small d is the diameter of the casing. So depending upon the undrained shear strength of your soil, you can think about what could be the possible the diameter of the stone column. So then uh, regarding the spacing, uh, usually the spacing is fixed, but if you want, you can also calculate the spacing based on these equations. So here are uh, two different equations are given for square pattern and for uh, this is a triangular pattern, triangular pattern. And there are some specific guidelines. In case of a triangular grid pattern, significant reduction in shape limit occurs only if the spacing is close to S by D less than or equal to 4. And piles are installed to full depth of the consolidation level, uh, layer. However, too close spacing, that is S by D less than or equal to, is not feasible from construction point of view. Okay. So that means you need to have an optimum spacing to the diameter of the stone column. Else, so the other kind of the problems might arise in the field. So thus, the spacing S by D of 2.5 to 4 is adapted for most practical problems. So where S is the spacing, D is the diameter. So if you take the interrelation between these two, so that uh, you will not encounter any kind of the construction problems in the future. So closer spacing is preferred under isolated footing than beneath the large ramps. So this is, uh, we cannot say this is very general guideline. Uh, in case of the isolated footing, the size of the footing is very small. So therefore, in a smaller area, you need a more number of stone columns. But if you, if you take a raft foundation, raft foundation is spread over a larger area. So therefore, you can go for the higher space. So then... Uh, Sir, what is the EI here? EI, uh, it is wide ratio, I guess. That I think has been given here. E I by E I minus E. Uh, I also do not know exactly. Uh, let me see it. I will clarify it. Okay. So there is another relationship uh, that is used to determine the possible settlement, the possible settlement of the ground. So here you can see. Uh, it is a relationship between settlement of treated ground to uh, the settlement of untreated ground versus the stone column spacing versus the strength of the clay material. Now, let us look at this graph specifically. This is valued only for undrained shear strength of the clay between 20 and 40 kilopascals only. So, that means uh, if it is above, it might be providing uh, enough lateral resistance. While if it is below 20 kilopascals, then the ordinary stone column technique might not be feasible. You may have to go for the encased stone column. But you can use this graph to calculate the relative difference in settlement between the stone column or between the treated and untreated ground. Treated and untreated. So there are other parameters also that is uh, area replacement ratio. So this also we understood. It can be defined as area of the stone column divided by the uh, overall area of the zone of influence. So here you can see the zone of influence for triangular pattern and for square or rectangular pattern. So the area replacement ratio AS is defined as AS by A where AS is area of the stone column. AS area of the stone column and A is the total area within the unit cell including the stone column. And uh, people uh, have derived some relationship between AS, area replacement ratio. Sir, yeah. Sir, can you please repeat? Actually, your voice was not coming, sir. 
Ah, okay. Okay, okay. Yeah. See, uh, here there is uh, another parameter that were introduced is area replacement ratio AS. So this is one of the geometrical parameter. So this is this can be used to design the relative diameter between stone column and the zone of influence. Suppose if we, if we fix the diameter of the stone column, then we can understand what could be the possible zone of diameter or alternatively, suppose uh, in most of the situations what happens is uh, we I know the overall zone of influence area or diameter of the stone column. So then the fixation of the spacing becomes very difficult because uh, if it is too close spacing, there will be some construction problems. If it is wider spacing, then the, the there may not be much overlap of the zone of influence. So in those situations and moreover, the stress distribution between the soil and the column is very significantly in case of the stone column. OK, so just to avoid all those things. So new parameters in the form of area replacement ratio are the settlement reduction, the stress reduction factor, all those were introduced in the stone columns. And here uh, the area replacement ratio is defined as AS by A, that is area of the stone column by the overall uh, area of the zone of influence and which is further related to spacing and diameter. So this also indicates that if you fix the area replacement ratio, so and if you assume some diameter, we can able to determine the spacing. So if you want to do the more analytical uh, modeling, so these kinds of the equations are highly useful to understand the effectiveness of the technique. Effectiveness of the technique. So other equations also uh, based on the similarity. So AC by A. AC means the area of the stone column. And A is the a total area of the unit cell, which is related to uh, K into R by S. So th this is based on the mathematical jugglery. Like if you take the rectangular or square pattern, all these pi r2 pi by square root 3 will come. So pi in case of the rectangle and 2 pi by square root 3 in case of the triangle. Uh, if you take any triangle between three columns, uh, if you measure the length of it, the vertical height, so then you will get 2 pi by square root 3. Then uh, the other design consideration is what should be the depth of the improvement and area of the improvement. This will be predominantly decided based on the borehole profile uh, and uh, based on the client's requirement. So one important thing that I did not cover is how to determine the bearing capacity. So all the bearing capacities are on the basis of the bulging phenomenon of the stone column. Now when I say bulging, it is obvious that we are inherently taking the large stone column. It's not a short, long stone column. It's not a short stone column. So we also understood the bulging might predominantly occur at a depth of two times of the diameter of the stone column, and the bulging might extend to a as depth as four times of the diameter of the stone column. And these are the equations. So. Uh, this is the analogy for determining the bearing capacity. Uh, first, granular columns, Brown's uh, in, in uh, 1978. So based on his own analogy. So when he has done the assumption, so he has made the assumption that the load on the column is different than the load on the soil. So load on the column is delta sigma C, load on the soil is delta sigma S. Now, assuming these things, he tried to understand what would be the lateral stress coming on to the soil column, coming onto the granular column. So therefore, accordingly, uh, he has proposed the equation for lateral stress, sigma r. The lateral stress from the surrounding soil is delta sigma s plus 2 cu by sine 2 pi uh, into 1 plus tan xi p by tan xi. So all the parameters are shown in this diagram, so you can understand. And once sigma r is calculated, so then uh, we can we can understand the net load bearing capacity of the column, which is nothing but delta sigma c is equal to sigma r into kp. Kp means the passive pressure. So passive at the pressure coefficient. So uh, you know 
when we define or when we have dealt with the earth pressure theory, we have defined all these parameters. K is nothing but sigma h by uh, sigma v. Sigma h by sigma v. So the same thing is valid here. So the total load to be borne by the stone column is nothing but sigma r into kp. While there we have used all the equations either active or passive or at rest condition. So now this is a further derivation, but ultimately uh, based on the extensive experimental investigations, it is found that the ultimate bearing capacity of the column is approximately 25.75 times of the undrained shear strength of the soil. So this is another relationship proposed and other relationships also proposed uh, other solutions by different researchers for lateral soil resistance sigma r is equal to sigma r naught plus k1 into c you, you can see the difference between the this equation proposed by the browns and other equations so here sigma r is a function of the load on the soil and undrained strength of the soil while this equation so sigma r is equal to sigma r naught to lateral soil stress induced by the overburden stress in fact both are same in the previous equation it was delta sigma s it is re-represented as delta sigma r naught. K1 is at present condition, a constant obtained by different researchers. And CUV is on the right side. So the, the way they derived is only different way. And the, the ultimate bearing capacity of the individual stone column can be expressed as sigma r naught plus K, uh, K1 into CO into KP. That is K dash, uh, sim further simplification, K dash KP into C. K dash KP into C. Where K dash is a constant, considering the effect of sigma r naught, which is not significant at a shallow depth. So then uh, here uh, the different values are tabulated depending upon the soil type or depending upon the undrained shear strength of the soil. So if Cu is 19.4 or within the range of 20. So then soil type is clay, K dash is uh, 4, 3, 6.4, 5, so on and so forth, K dash and K then uh, who has proposed all these different values. Then here also it ultimately boiled down to the same. In the previous case, it is proposed the Q ultimate of the stone column is 20.75 times of the undrained shear strength. Now uh, here also it is boiled down to the same. Q ultimate C is equals to 20 times of C. Okay, so in a uh, nutshell, we can summarize that the ultimate bearing capacity of the stone column is approximately 20 times the undrained shear strength of the clay that we are dealing with. And as we also know that when any load is applied, uh, if majority of the load although going onto the column, but a small amount of the load goes onto the soil. So therefore Q ultimate is nothing but load taken by the stone column versus load taken by the soil. Load taken by the soil. So therefore that is related with the area replacement ratio that is as which is defined as ac by total a so this equation can be used to calculate suppose if i know the load bared by the column then i can able to determine the load should be borne by the soil uh, because i know the q ultimate that is superstructure load. so i know the superstructure load and if i know the ultimate load of the column then I can able to understand what would be the amount of the load going onto the soil. And that is useful to calculate the settlements. So these are further equations proposed by the Hughes in the 1975. Q ultimate of the stone column is nothing but tan square 45 plus 5. This is nothing but your Kp. Tan square 45 plus 5 dash by 2 is nothing but your Kp value. And uh, the another factor is 4 times of Cu plus sigma r dash. Sigma R dash. So it is more or less like a, the previous equation with uh, small change. So where Cu is undrained shear strength of the clay and Sigma R dash is effective radial stress as measured by the pressure meter, which can be approximately taken as two times of Cu again. So the net load is equal to Q, small Q U is net bearing capacity, ultimate bearing capacity and capital Q is ultimate bearing load. So which is simply multiplied with the area of the stone car. Uh, on the basis of the large scale model test, another, uh, so Christolas proposed uh, QE is equal to pi dl into Cu. So this is more or less looks like a, your uh, frictional, frictional resistance. 
if you look at this equation, so pi d l means surface area uh, multiplied by the unrained space. So this becomes the friction, so the frictional component. So on the other hand, so uh, Hughes and Wither and the field experience. So somebody has recommended uh, that the uh, allowable vertical stress on a single stone column may be obtained from the empirical expression that is sigma v is equal to 25 cu by m. While above equations talk about the ultimate load carrying capacity of the stone column. While if you want to know what would be the permeable, uh, permissible value of the bearing capacity, then you have to use sigma v is equal to 25 times of cu divided by the factor of you can assume any value of the factor. Then the next important part is uh, how do you calculate the settlement? Uh, there are two ways. One is by stress reduction method and next is by the improvement factor method. So in case of the stress reduction method, we know uh, if you recall your 1D consolidation, so uh, the final settlement S is equal to MV delta sigma into H. MV is equal to the coefficient. Uh, coefficient of volume change delta sigma is the load applied h is the thickness of the strata which is undergoing the consolidation acceleration consolidation and here uh, if you know the mv we can directly use it and if you do not know the value of the mv so this mv can be related with another parameter that is called as a constraint modulus ds constraint modulus of the soil so and which is again related to the elastic properties of the soil like elastic modulus of the soil es and vs that is poisons ratio then or alternatively ds can be correlated with the soil properties like for example e naught which is a initial wire ratio cc that is compression index sigma naught dash so that is initial effective or by the pressure okay so the coefficient of volume consolidation can either directly be calculated if uh, the constraint modulus is known or if the elastic properties of the soil are known or the consolidation soil properties of the soil are known. So both ways it is okay. So then the settlement of the composite foundation based on the compression of the soil that is S dash is equal to M, M dash Vs delta sigma S into H. So all these are belongs to the soil properties. Then the settlement, the settlement ratio of the composite foundation S dash by S. So S dash means the amount of the settlement undergone by the soil material. S is the amount of the soil and so amount of settlement undergone by the column. So incidentally, if you look at this equation, so this equation, the ratio of settlement between the soil and the column is directly related to another parameter that is mu. That is called as a stress reduction factor. So in the previous class, we have derived an equation for stress reduction factor. Please recall. Okay. So now this indicates the stress distribution between the soil and the column. And you can use all these equations to calculate uh, settlement and the bearing capacity. Uh, this is another equation. Uh, I don't think so. All these are required. Uh, this is uh, improvement factor method. So here in this case, uh, the improvement factor, uh, if factor was defined that is S dash or 1 by M. S dash is equal to 1 by I M. That is improvement factor, improvement factor, which is related to uh, area replacement ratio AS and the friction angle of the aggregate material. So these are the predefined graphs. You can use these graphs to calculate the final settlement of the stone column that is S dash. So this graph shall be provided in the exam. So therefore, don't need to worry. Then uh, stability, uh, this part I will leave it. This is not required. So this is what all about uh, the stone columns. Uh, the part which I did not cover in the last class is the bearing capacity. So that has been covered and the settlement that is also now covered. Sir, this formula also provided. No, formulas will not be provided. Only charts will be provided.